Hi everyone and welcome to today's session called Getting to Know the Verse in English Placement Test Plus Remote Monitoring. Today we will be hearing from Andrew Kahn, Pearson English's Senior Market Development Manager. As a graduate of the London School of Economics, Andrew has been with Pearson for over 14 years. He travels the world meeting with schools, universities, and national governments to help ensure that Pearson's assessment solutions best meet the needs of learners and teachers. As some quick housekeeping before we get started, we will be having a short Q&A session towards the end of this webinar. So please feel free to submit your questions in the question box at any time during the talk. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. This webinar session will also be recorded and available shortly after the session in case you would like to share it with friends or colleagues. And now I'm happy to pass it over to Andrew. Thank you, Jen. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the assessment summer session uh, from Pearson. I uh, hope everybody is as happy and as healthy as possible under these somewhat unusual circumstances. As Jen mentioned, I'm Andrew Kahn. I'm the Senior Market Development Manager for the English Assessment Team at Pearson. And today we'll be focusing on the Versant English Placements Test with remote monitoring. So in this presentation, we will go through an introduction to the test itself, some information on how to use the scoring methodology and mechanisms, and an overview of the remote monitoring service, amongst other things. And as Jen mentioned as well, we will have time for questions at the end. But first, uh, a brief introduction to Pearson English. People often say, okay, I've heard of Pearson, it's a big company, but what's your background with English? And it's a question I absolutely love to hear, because it means I can turn around and say, oh, we've been doing this for a while, uh, 274 years to be exact. So going back into the distant past, a man named Dr. Samuel Johnson had an idea for the first commercially available dictionary of the English language. But he also had a problem. He didn't have any money to support himself while he was writing the dictionary. So he went to a publisher called Mr. Longman, and Mr. Longman agreed to help out. Nine years later, in 1755, Dr. Johnson's dictionary was published by the Longman Publishing House, and today Pearson owns Longman. Longman is part of Pearson. And I like that story for a number of reasons, but partly because it really resonates with a lot of things that we're doing today. So there's innovation, there's risk taking, there's investing in the future responding to unmet customer needs and so on. So it's a, it's a really nice story. And today, Pearson is the world's leading learning solutions provider. Our English courseware, um, by which we mean books and online resources, reaches around 16 and a half million people each year. But also at the forefront of English language assessment, uh, we have about 100 million test items scored annually most of which use our automated scoring technology. We work with around 200,000 educators in the field of English each year on professional development, and we were the original developers of the global scale of English, which is a granular tool for teachers and learners, building on the foundations of the common European framework of reference, designed to make teaching English and measuring progress easier and more impactful. So Pearson offers a wide range of English assessments for a variety of different purposes. Um, there might be placement tests to determine learner proficiency in a fast and flexible way, helping inform teacher decisions. Uh, through to benchmark testing, which is the idea of using multiple test attempts to track incremental improvement over time, all the way through to our secure tests in the certification and verification categories like PT Academic and PT Home, who are committed to having suitable tests for every single stage of the learner cycle, ensuring the tests we provide to people are generally useful tools. They're not just uh, barriers for students to overcome. They need to give information to the teachers and to the learners that they can go away and take on board 
and yeast to improve themselves. It's also important to note that VERSI is not a test, it's a portfolio of tests that are used for a variety of different purposes. And that might be in the corporate context or it might be in the educational context. So if you're a company that needs to understand the level of English of people you're potentially looking to hire, then there'll be a test for you. Uh, whether you want to just assess facilities spoken English or something broader. If you're a university or a school looking to understand the proficiency of students or potential students, there's a test for you as well. I would be focusing on the educational side today, but it's worth noting in passing, last time I checked, I think it was five or six of the world's top 10 most valuable companies were using Versa tests somewhere either in their recruiting processes or in their learning and development processes. We work with online retailers, airlines, banks, tech uniforms, et cetera, et cetera, as well as universities and schools. We'll focus now on the Versant English placement test, or VET for short. What do we mean by the Versant advantage? Really, tests can be taken almost anywhere, online or offline, on-site or off-site. As long as you've got a computer, a headset and a microphone, you can take the Versant English placement test. The learners can potentially take the test within a university, a partner school or even at home. Tests can be done any time of day, any day of the week, whenever you need them to take place. The test is only 50 minutes long. It's designed to be long enough for accuracy, but still enables institutions with a limited number of computers, for example, uh, to test large numbers of people every single day. And probably the most exciting feature of VET, however, is the use of Pearson's advanced machine scoring technology. That enables accurate, reliable results to come back within minutes. It's usually, I would say, 10 minutes for the results to come back. And that's not just for simple multiple choice, yes or no, true, false questions, but it covers sophisticated responses uh, for extended speech and writing as well. How do you see VET used in educational settings? I think the name for a lot of people suggests that it's just a placement test. Uh, and it, it really isn't. VET is used for a wide range of activities in the higher education context. It can, of course, be used as a diagnostic placement test. Uh, you might perhaps use that for determining which stream of an intensive English program a learner needs to go into or as a diagnostic aid to understand strengths and weaknesses a student might have if you're a teacher who is looking at remediation. It can also be used quite routinely as a proficiency test for admission to courses where a more formal test in the vein of the epidemic, IELTS, TOEFL, and so on, might be either unnecessary or impractical. Um, so, We've got a partner in Egypt, for example, that uh, has thousands and thousands of people who need to test in a very short space of time. Having a test you can use flexibly on your own premises uh, or potentially with remote monitoring from home um, that you can get through in a very, very quick space of time works very well for their needs. Equally, uh, under the current circumstances with COVID-19 that we're all dealing with, um, in some situations, it might be challenging to find those more formal tests. Either there isn't as much testing uh, as, uh, as they had previously been, or um, due to the circumstances, you have a very large number of people all looking to get tested at the same time. So having a little bit more flexibility about the tools that you're using can be quite useful. Traditionally, that's been done where the institution can typically physically proctor the tests on university premises, on school premises, or they have a partner school or an agent that they trust uh, that can do that for them. But as we'll see later, the new remote monitoring service brings even more flexibility to that. We also see VET used as an exit test from university programs, as a benchmark monitor to see improvement over time. Um, even as a tool in some cases to measure the proficiency of staff or prospective staff at a school or a university. But all sorts of different uses, not just a placement test. 
highlight some of the key benefits of using REX. It's a terrific tool for saving time. It's a fast and accurate test. It's also very easy and intuitive to run. If you think about all the heavy lifting that normally comes with institutional testing, that might be designing the test, face-to-face -face interviews, training markers, the actual marking of those tests, keeping track of results, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. VEPT can do all that for you in an end-to-end -end process that shouldn't really take more than an hour. So it's an enormously scalable solution, and it means that you can make important decisions as a school or as a university much, much faster. Hopefully that all sounds good, but of course it doesn't really mean a lot to you uh, unless you know a little bit more about the test and why you should trust the results that come back. So moving on to look a little bit at the test structure. As I mentioned, VEP is 50 minutes long, and we're often asked, how can we create a test that lasts under an hour, that still has a degree of accuracy and reliability comparable to or better than much longer exams? One of the reasons is the use of integrated item types, meaning that we can test more than one thing, for example, listening and writing or reading and speaking at the same time. Another is the way that the automated scoring engine can pick up a detailed, complex set of information points about proficiency from seemingly very simple item types. There are nine tests, uh, item types uh, in, in VET. You have read aloud, you have repeats, you have sentence build, you have conversations, you have typing, sentence completion, dictation, passage reconstruction, and summary and opinion. And for the sake of brevity, I won't explain each one. I'd recommend trying out VET for yourself. Uh, we can provide you the codes to do that, uh, or referring to our online tutorial or our test validation guide, which goes into a little bit more detail about the item types. But I will highlight two, because uh, I think they provide really nice examples of what we're doing. And across the whole of the Pearson English Assessment portfolio, I think I get asked one question almost more than anything else, which is why do your tests generally have dictation items in them? And it's something that a lot of teachers feel quite passionate about. Uh, it's something that they may be familiar with from their own days of learning English and think, wow, that's something I did many, many years ago. Is it not a bit outdated now to have a dictation exercise in the test? What can you really learn uh, about somebody and their ability to write down what they're hearing. And it's again, it's a really great question, but if you look at the academic literature on the subject, the answer is a surprisingly large amount. So in fact, it's one of the most um, reliable predictors of whether the test taker is a higher performing or a lower performing user of English. What it does really is require the learner and remember this is under significant time constraint, to process the meaning of the language they're hearing in sentence context. They then either need to use short-term memory to accurately remember the word string they've just heard or reconstruct that sentence from the meaning. They then need to be able to write that sentence down using the appropriate syntax and spelling. It's also a useful measure of productive as well as receptive language. And if you don't think that sounds very challenging, I'd recommend trying it out in a language other than the ones that you're very familiar with and see how well you get on. My French is absolutely terrible. I tried this out with a versant French test and I won't embarrass myself with, uh, with the results that you do not score highly unless you can really use that language effectively. Read aloud is another really deceptively simple item type. So a learner just reads a passage that they're given. From this, we get a measure of their pronunciation, their oral fluency, information on their reading rate and their rhythm, as well as a picture of how well they understand what they're reading. And that's informed by things like miscues and word substitutions. If you're reading something 
and uh, you're just kind of reading the words and do not understand the meaning of those words, it's extremely likely that you will substitute other words that look quite similar, but do not make sense in context. Again, a huge amount of information coming out of that. And that's something, again, I really like about this test. So it takes a very traditional, very, very straightforward exercise that everybody's familiar with, and it uses technology to draw all sorts of incredibly useful information from it. We also have more complex items in the test, like uh, reconstructing passages of writing in our own words uh, from a prompt that disappears after a short space of time, or asking them to summarize the opinion contained within a piece of writing and put forward their own views on the subject. So we've got longer items in there as well. Just an item of typing uh, item. This isn't scored, but it does provide a useful data point for teachers. So it's relatively unusual these days, but it still happens sometimes. If, if a learner, um, if their home language does not use the Roman alphabet, they might be less familiar with the keyboard layouts of typing in English. Uh, so if you can see, for example, as a teacher, you can see a high speaking score and a low writing score. You can also see low typing accuracy or speed. Perhaps you might be able to infer from that that the learner is being impaired by the input method not necessarily that underlying ability with English. And although those item types are fixed, tests that learners will see are randomized for a massive bank of uh, calibrated items. We have a nice poll question here. Um, what level of information as a teacher, as a school, as a university, whoever you may be, do you want to see in test results or what information do you need to see in test results? So A, just the overall score, intermediate, proficient, B1, C1, etc, etc. A detailed score per skill, 51, 52, 53 on a scale. C, a detailed score plus extra information on current capabilities uh, in words, not just as a score. Or D, a detailed score, current skills, plus guidance on improvement. So if you could vote for what actually resonates most with you, that'd be wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you, Jen. Moving on. What do you see with the results? The VET is not a pass or fail test. We have an overall score as well as individual sub scores for listening, reading, speaking, and writing. And you'll see that overall score on the VET scale as well as the global scale of English and the CEFR. You also get a summary of the candidate's abilities as well as recommendations for improvement by skill. If you're not familiar with the VEP scale or the global scale of English or even the CEFR, don't worry. We've got concordance documents from a range of leading competitor assessments, meaning there'll always be a way to make that score meaningful to your institution. Looking towards the future, we're keen to do even more with the results that come back. For example, linking recommendations for improvement to chapter references in peers and books make it even easier for teachers to target particular areas for remediation. So again, coming back to that idea of a test not just being a test, a test is a tool for the learner or a tool for the teacher to help drive improvement as we go forward. So, moving on. In terms of scoring engine, the other question I get asked a lot is how can a computer accurately measure extended speech and writing? Well, let's be honest, I get asked that a lot less now than I did 10 years ago. I 
think the work that Kirsten's done with PT Academic and with other tests has really helped people understand um, how it works and obviously that it works as well. Um, you know, teachers all over the world are using these as methods for tests already. I think the easiest way to understand it, um, it's the easiest way certainly for me to understand it, is that we use artificial intelligence and machine learning technology to train computers to look for the same traits as human markers. We do this by getting excellent human writers to mark thousands and thousands of responses to each question. And as they do that, they're training the scoring engine to do the same thing. So we're not replacing human judgment. We're enabling it to be replicated anywhere, anytime, the full uh, repeatability, reliability, free of any individual error or bias. What we can see is accuracy. So very, very precise, accurate scores. And consistency. So learners with the same level of English will get the same scores anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter if you're in country A or country B, if you have the same level of English, you will get the same outcomes. This is a graph from a study we ran. It shows what happens when human marking and machine scoring is compared side by side. You can see there's a very, very strong correlation there. And we have a fantastic test validation report available that goes into a little bit more detail on things like beta rate of reliability uh, and so on. Uh, it gives a little bit more of the technical information underpinning the person methodology. And internationally, uh, we deliver well over a million versant tests each year. So they're relied on, as I mentioned, not just by universities, but by some of the biggest companies in the world, part of the hiring processes, even by government departments and things like that. So that track record over I'd say, more than 20 years of organizations knowing they can trust a versant score tells its own story. Another poll question. And again, there's no right or wrong answer to any of this. Uh, we're really just looking for your own ideas, your own opinions, things like that understand. How comfortable are you with the idea of artificial intelligence scoring exams? A, I'm very comfortable. B, I'm quite comfortable, but I'd want to know a little bit more. Or C, I'd need a lot more information to be comfortable. Okay. Moving on now to some of the most frequently asked questions about VET. Is VET an adaptive test? No, it is not an adaptive test. We do have adaptive tests in our portfolio, and from an academic perspective, there are positives and negatives both to adaptive and non-adaptive or fixed form testing. In some cases, uh, learners might find adaptive tests that get harder, the better you do, to be a little bit more stressful. Some people do, some people don't. But one of the major advantages of fixed form testing, like VET, is you don't have to be connected to the internet 100% of the time to be able to take that test. What is the cut score for that? That's entirely up to your institution, your university, or your school to determine. So set scores that you feel comfortable with by aligning your target VEP score to other tests that you might use. Do I need to test all four skills? Yes, with a VEP, you do. So we use integrated item types. So we always test listening, reading, speaking, and writing. If you only need to have a speaking test or a writing test, there are other assessments in the versus portfolio that you might want to take a look at. 
Another really good question that comes up a lot is, will the artificial intelligence scoring have an issue with my accent? I think the answer is, as long as your speech would be intelligible to a native speaker of English, accent does not matter. So pronunciation does impact scores, but accent does not in itself. Can I stop learners from seeing their scores? Yes, absolutely. If you don't want to send your scores to the students, you can lock that functionality down. A really challenging one is, are there accommodations for learners with special requirements? We are committed to finding solutions for this, but at present, VET is a timed test, and the timing of each item is part of the test construct. We don't have any flexibility uh, within the test to adjust the timing as things stand. We generally say our um, you know, in lieu of giving learners more time, institutions would probably want to bear any special requirements the learners might have when interpreting the scores. Can a learner get the same test twice? A bit like uh, asking um, whether you can get struck by lightning twice. And theoretically, it might be mathematically possible, uh, but thankfully for all of us, it, it's not very likely. The tests are randomly drawn from a huge bank. So it's very unlikely there'll be substantial overlap in content across two test attempts, or even with 10 candidates uh, sitting in the room taking the test at the same time. They'll see different content. Another question that comes up a lot are how are the tests with remote monitoring different from standard tests? And the answer is that they're not. So VET is VET, with or without remote monitoring. The only difference is whether you're on camera when you're taking the test. Another interesting poll question. In setting the top scores, in comparison with which other exams would be most important for you as a teacher? We have A, you get it out. B, IELTS. B, poetry. B, poetry. Or E, another one. Okay. Another common question that we get is does a learner need to prepare for that? I think the, the short answer is you don't really need to prepare at all for that. The test has been designed in such a way to make it fair and accurate for learners who've never seen VEP before or who haven't really done any preparation. It, it's designed to be uh, equally accessible for everybody. So there are some useful tips that you can offer, and there's a nice video on the website that offers some guidance around that. So things like uh, not needing to whisper or not needing to shout, for example. And test familiarization can actually be useful even if the test doesn't really require it just to make learners feel a little bit more comfortable. But often the stress of thinking about taking a test is worse than the stress of actually taking it. So knowing that there's nothing to worry about can help. So we have a useful test walkthrough on YouTube to demystify that, if you like. But when it comes to preparation, the most important factor in getting a score representative of your ability is preparing the test taking environment. So good lights, uh, quiet location, comfortable chair, and of course, that headset with a microphone connected to your computer. And just because VET can be taken anywhere doesn't mean that it should. So we once had a, for another Versa product, uh, we once had a test taker complain about the score they got. And it turned out that they're taking a test in the back of a taxi, going along a busy street with a radio in the background. So obviously, that's not ideal. You're not going to get the maximum score you can get under those circumstances with a lot of background noise and with a lot of distraction. The other test tip that we'd always give is that classic uh, piece of exam advice that should be drummed into every child uh, from the age of about five years old. Um, before you start answering a question, read the instructions. If it says write 50 words, 
don't write 300 words. Very, very simple, but something that people, even native English speakers, very often slip up on is not reading the instructions properly. These are some of the universities and pathway providers around the world using the best. We work with universities in the UK, US, Australia, Canada, Egypt, Jordan, Chile, Panama, the list goes on. It's a, it's a really strong number. So again, I hope this sounds like a very interesting tool. Um, we've looked at what VET is. I think we also need to look at what it is not. Another likely question that come up for a lot of people is, is this a replacement for people academic? And the short answer is no, it is not. So with or without remote monitoring, it's not really intended to be a replacement for PT academic. PT academic is the gold standard high stakes English language test. Uh, we use biometric data, in-person proctoring, CCTV cameras, all sorts of other things to ensure that the tests are free of malpractice. What that means is that Pearson validates the authenticity and fairness of every single PT academic school that we release. PT academic is also a direct to learner exam, and that's very, very important. It means that the test taker can go and book and take a test at a secure Pearson test center and receive results without having to go through a university or through an agent or through a school. They can then assign those results to any university that accepts the test, and that does not work that way. We do know, however, that a lot of those formal options, as I was saying, are not always available. So during the current coronavirus situation, testing has been stopped or reduced in many places, and there's very high demand for those tests. So people are looking for alternatives. And even outside of those very difficult circumstances, a lot of universities and schools look for pragmatic solutions in places where testing is not always easy or the price point of traditional high stakes assessment poses a challenge. We need something that is flexible, pragmatic, cost effective, doesn't cost anything like uh, IELTS took for the academic. What we can offer with VET is a tool for universities to understand the English capabilities of their learners and their potential learners. And again, I would emphasize that it is a tool for universities, schools, and their partners, rather than something marketed directly to learners. What we'll do is provide accurate, flexible tests. And with the new remote monitoring option, we'll provide evidence of how those tests were taken. And we'll put the information in the hands of those administrators at the universities and schools to make appropriate decisions for their institution. So it's very important to note that if you are, for example, a university agent, this is not a test that you would simply go and say to your, your students, uh, go and take that and the university will accept it. You need to have a relationship with the university. The university needs to confirm to you, the agent, that they will be happy accepting a VET test taken under the circumstances that you are able to provide. So in some cases, they may accept from one agent, in some cases, they may not accept from other agents, just because they don't have the strong relationship of trust with a particular organization. So have that discussion with the universities. We can support you with that as well, in terms of providing access to testing materials, access to information about what that is, if your university partner has not heard of it. But you do need to have that discussion with the university directly. So that brings us on to the remote monitoring aspect. As you can imagine, uh, we've recently had a lot of schools and universities come along to us and say, we like the test, we've been using it a long time, or it sounds great, uh, but what happens if I can't be in the same room or city or country as the test taker? And until recently, we've not had a really good answer for it. Uh, at difficult times, we have to be creative. So we partnered with an organization called HirePro to provide AI-based video monitoring of learners. And again, to be clear, this is an optional add-on to that, not something we've implemented across every single test. Uh, you can still uh, have just standard VET if you can do in-person proctoring, or if you simply trust the test takers, uh, then you probably don't need to have the, the video monitoring as well. What does the video monitoring do? 
It's a browser-based service that captures video of test takers when they're taking that or any other version of test and makes that video available to administrators at your institution. So as a school or a university, you'd assign the test to the learner, they'd take the test, and you would be able to see what they were up to while they were taking the test. You might be thinking, okay, that sounds fine, but I don't want to have to sit through every single video of every single learner to make sure they're behaving themselves. And I wouldn't either. So that's where the clever part comes in. Uh, we have AI detection systems that automatically flag suspicious behavior for review. And you can filter out all those tests that are not determined to be suspicious and just focus on the ones that might be questionable. Just a quick note on our partners at Hyperbro. Uh, we've been doing something similar to this in India for, for quite some time for the corporate market. And um, Hyperbro were our partners for that and um, fantastic partner to work with. So they were the obvious choice for us when we we're expanding this out globally in the education markets. Um, they've been around for a while, uh, 16 years. Uh, they're one of the world's top recruitment technology specialists. Their servers are located in Ireland, so they're fully EU GDPR compliant. And they work with great companies such as Daimler, um, Texas Instruments, Russell House Cooper, Forward, Dell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a really wonderful partner to work with. I'll show you how that system works in a moment. But first, um, a quick note on what the system picks up. So different faces or multiple faces appearing on the screen. Obstruction of the camera. Learners moving out of the camera's view or looking away from the screen multiple times. A suspicious background activity or suspicious background movement. And learners navigating away from the test screen. You can also upload a photo of the learner when you're assigning the test to them. And the system will use facial recognition technology to indicate whether it's the same person who actually took the test. And the objective is not to shut the test down if anything is potentially suspicious. Uh, it's just to provide really all the evidence to the test administrators to use your own judgments. There might be a, an innocent explanation uh, from what you can see in the video. As an example, we had a, a nice conversation with a university uh, two weeks ago. Um, where one of the administrators had taken the test and their test had been flagged as suspicious. And they were questioning, why was my test flagged as suspicious? And I was able to say, uh, do you have a dog? And uh, the administrator said, yes, uh, I've got two dogs. And I knew that because what had been flagged is the dog running around in the background, triggering that uh, flagging of suspicious activity because there's a lot of background activity. And uh, ultimately, as the administrator, I can log in, I can see, okay, not a problem. That's something that's easy to explain away. So rather than just saying anything that's flagged as suspicious is automatically wrong, you can't accept it. Again, it's giving you evidence of what was going on in the background so you can take your own decisions as to what's appropriate. Now, what I'll do is I will hopefully bring up the administration. So, Hopefully you should be able to see the, the login screen. So I've looked in the admin system, the proctoring admin system, and I've filtered here for suspicious candidates. So I've, I've looked at the suspicious ones, I've taken out all the non-suspicious ones, and I've found one here, Mudal Kumar, who seems to be suspicious. And I'll look a little bit more detail at what's going on with his test. I should note that Mudal Kumar is a, is a colleague from Higher Pro, he's not a real student. So what I can do is I can open up this video and I can play the video to see what he was doing when he was taking the test. Now the video is 17 minutes long. I don't want to sit through the whole thing, but I don't need to because there's a bar at the bottom that tells me what I should be looking at. So it says suspicious here. I click on that. I can see immediately there's somebody else in frame. Now, Clearly, there's something going on here. The system also flags anything that it's not sure about but wants me to review uh, to make my own decision. By clicking here, the learner has disappeared from the screen. Again, there might be a good reason for that. It's something you can ask them about, but 
it is something that is quite obviously suspicious. If you disappear from the screen for a substantial amount of time, that is highly suspicious. And if you don't want to watch the whole video, you can also just look at these thumbnails. So the thumbnails will show you any suspicious activity. So there's a, a photo taken uh, at multiple points throughout the test. But if anything is flagged as suspicious, the photos become more frequent. So you should be able to see a larger number of uh, photos from anything that is looking a little bit suspicious there. Moving down, you can see here, um, there's also a face match element to it as well. So the institution has uploaded a photo of the real Mirigal Kumar, and that is on the right. On the left, you will see the person that took the test. Now, the system will automatically use the facial recognition technology to determine how similar those people are. And you can see here a match of 17%. That might be because they have the same hair color, they have wearing glasses, whatever it might be, but it's clear that they're not the same person. And that's why that match is so low. So again, automatically flagging that as suspicious and something that you can review. As mentioned as well, there is a nice feature here, which is device proctoring. So the idea again is not to shut down the test, but to give you information on how many times the test taker navigated away from that test window. And we can see here, navigated away none. So this learner did what they were supposed to, which is sit down and take that test um, without navigating away from the window. In reality, it's very easy to do it once or twice accidentally. There's not a great deal a learner can do with the way that the VEPT test is structured to actually cheat by going to Google and trying to Google something. It's not going to help them, um, but it's a nice way of keeping tabs on what they were actually doing when they were taking the test. So just a quick overview of that remote monitoring system. Uh, the administrator assigns the test via email. The students are prompted to log in and take the test. If you have not already uploaded a photograph of them, uh, you can get them to take a selfie or upload a photograph that meets your particular specifications, whether it's uh, an ID document, a government ID, whatever it might be. The students take the test and the administrator can download the scores and review the session recordings for any potential fraudulent behavior. So that's how the remote monitoring system works. And again, it's been designed for uh, corporate use initially, but works really well for universities as well. So it has to be fast, it has to be efficient, there can't be any time wasting, and I think really that's what the, the system provides. We have another poll question here. How comfortable would you be using remote monitoring for tests? A, very comfortable. B, somewhat comfortable but I would need to know more. Or C, I'm not sure that this would work for my students. Uh, so please feel free to, to vote. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. So next steps, if you want to know more, uh, contact your local Pearson representative to ask about VEPs or VEPs with remote monitoring. Alternatively, if you do not know who your Pearson representative is, uh, you can get in contact with me directly, andrew.khan at pearson.com, or by using the host webinar contact form. I uh, would love to hear from you, not just if you want to uh, buy tests, uh, but if you want to know anything more about the test, if you want to try out a few tests, anything like that, we'd be very happy to, to support you with that. Um, also, do not forget to join us for our next webinar. So we've got a fantastic session coming up uh, next week with Mike Mayer, I believe, and Jeff uh, So Mike Mayer is uh, the expert behind the global scale of English. So we'll be talking about how to use all those amazing teacher resources that Pearson gives away for free for teachers, all available online, to really understand uh, incremental improvements in English, understand learning objectives in a much more detailed way than the general team training can provide, and how to tie together assessment and learning resources using the global scale of English as your glue. So I think that brings me 
just on time to questions. And uh, Jan, do we have any questions in the chat? Hi, Andrew. Yes, we have lots of questions. And first, thank you very much for Fantastic. that very informative session. Um, okay. So the first question is, is it necessary to test all four skills in VET? Good question. Uh, with VET, yes, it is. As I mentioned, we have those integrated item types. So listening and, uh, and writing or reading and uh, speaking. So we do need to test all of those. However, as I mentioned, VEPT is not a single, uh, the Versant portfolio is not a single test. VEPT is one test with a few of them. But we do have a test that just tests speaking. But we've also got a writing test as well. So if you just want to focus on speaking, uh, or speaking and listening really, or just want to focus on writing, you can do that. But with VEPT itself, yes, you do need to cover all four skills. Great, thank you. The next question is, to whom is that useful for? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think that we see uh, a lot of use with universities. So those might be universities that are using it for intensive English programs. So they're seeing it as a, uh, as a kind of a diagnostic test, a way of tracking progression, but also for access to courses. So if you, for whatever reason, you can't use those traditional tests, um, BT academic arts, so forth. This is a way to replace what you might be doing with institutional testing. Um, so instead of having to create a test yourself to test those students when the other options aren't available, uh, you can have a test that is reliable, uh, standardized, very fast, very cost effective. We see universities primarily as being the users, but we also see a lot of schools using that um, for different purposes. Um, Perhaps even employers in some situations, employers that want to know the general English uh, across all four skills. We do have another test for the four skills essential for business, um, but some employers do like to have uh, the VEP test uh, as an alternative to that. So really anybody who needs to know about the proficiency of a particular learner in a fast, flexible, cost-effective way uh, will be getting some use out of VEP, I think. Great, thank you. The next question is, how can we resolve human error? If, for example, the answer is correct, but a punctuation mark is missed, would the answer be considered wrong? I think it depends on the circumstances. So yes, um, there's no right or wrong. I think it's, it's, uh, it's looking at uh, in things in a, in a deeper way than that. So you might have a missing punctuation mark, and you might have a slightly lower score than other ways for grammar. But if the substance of the questions, if the substance of the answer rather is correct, if you're getting the right spelling, if the meaning is correct, if the rest of the grammar is correct, then you no know, human error creeps into every single test. And this is a really interesting point because we very often see native English speakers don't always get 100%. Uh, score on the test. They don't always get 80 out of 80, which is the maximum score. And it's because people make errors. The thing is, those errors do not massively, massively decrease your score. They don't disproportionately affect your score. If you make a couple of errors, like everybody does, um, but the rest of your, your ability is, is strong, you'll get a result that matches the ability. At the same time, we would always recommend, as far as possible, uh, read back your, your, what you've written. So make sure your punctuation and, and spelling and grammar and things like this are correct. It is important to do that because you are potentially losing a mark here and a mark there. It won't massively impact your schools, but if you know if it's the difference between uh, getting one point uh, and uh, you know, that one point is important to you for whatever reason, it's always good to go back and check and be precise as possible. But yeah, human error is, is built in to, to everything that we do, and we understand that as an assessment organization. Thank you. The next question is, are all of the task types addressed for all of the test takers, no matter their levels of proficiency? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. Yes, all of those uh, task types are in there for every single test. Um, so it is a, what we call a barometer test. It's one test. It's not split up into multiple levels. 
Um, so as a learner, you will take the test. You will see the same item types as every other learner. You will see different items themselves, but the same item types. And we will judge your proficiency based on how you interact with those items. And some of those items are a pitch of a particular CFR level. So there will be some things in the test if you're coming in at a particularly low level, uh, that are above the level uh, that you'd be comfortable with. But really, you still make an attempt at that test. You still get points for whatever you can do. We also use what we call scalar items. So items that are broad in their scope, that give learners of all sorts of ranges of ability an equal chance of responding. So relatively prompt, but what we're really measuring in terms of whether you're a high performing or a lower performing uh, candidate is the way that you've responded to that question. What you've done with that simple prompt determines whether you might be a C1 score or an A2 score for a company. Thank you. In regards to remote monitoring, do the suspicious activities have an effect on scoring? Does the system require no, us not at to... All. Okay, second part of the question. <laughs> uh, does the system require us to confirm to um, score those candidates? No, 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 not at all. So those results will come back, whatever happens. And again, this is the idea. We do not want to shut down the test. We do not want to prevent anybody from having their test scored. We can do that in minutes, it goes back to you. But what happens is ultimately, it's not about whether the test is scored, it's whether that test result is accepted by the institution. So if you're a university or a school, um, you might be able to see the score from the learner, but you can see somebody sitting next to them, or they've got a book open and they're, they're really out of the book. And you can say, well, I'm not going to accept that score from that learner. I'm going to say, this is suspicious, and make them take the test again, for example. So it's not about providing no score. It's not about saying this test taker has done something wrong. It's about saying this is suspicious. We're providing you as the administrator from the school or the university with information as to why we think that's suspicious. Whether you accept that result or not, whether you accept that score is up to your own judgment. And again, you can choose not to release the score to the learner if you're not happy with, uh, with the way they've taken the test. Or for any reason, if you simply don't want to give them the result because you think it's private and you don't want to spend a conversation with them, not a problem. You can lock those results down and only you as the administrator will see them. Thank you. The next question is, how often can I test students with this test? Uh, again, a really good question. And um, this, is, this is, I think, very, you know, typically people think in traditional ways of the, the test session. Uh, so with some of our tests, we have session-based tests. You can only do it six times a year, or three times a year, whatever it might be. With VET, it's entirely up to you as the administrator. Who, you know, if you're assigning tests to learners, it can be any time of day, any day of the week, as many times as you want to, to provide the test. So what we'd always say is, if you're using it to test different people, then full flexibility, go for it whenever you want to, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's entirely up to you. If you're using it as a measure to assess incremental improvement with one learner, so getting them to take a, a test at the start of the course and getting them to take their test at the end of the course, you do need to have uh, you know, a reasonable amount of time to learn, otherwise you're not going to get really useful results. So it depends on the level of that learner, about 100 hours of learning, whatever it might be. We recommend a good gap between test attempts for a single learner if it's being used as a monitor of uh, improvements. If you've got a learner who's taken the test, they don't think they're having a good day or some background noise, whatever it might be, and they're using that for mission uh, placement, whatever it is, you can get the same learner to take the test immediately after the one and tell them to go. Uh, uh, move the cat out of the room, whatever it was was affecting the first time, not a problem. It's up to you, administrator, to say when the testing takes place. Great, thank you. The next question is Could you use VEPT for lower age students? Again, really good question. I think well, it depends on what we mean by lower age. 
So typically we have seen in some countries um, students from the age of around 14 take VETS. Uh, and the majority of them, I think that they, they don't have too many challenges. VET is designed for uh, from older adults. Uh, that's kind of the context in which it was designed, particularly with an eye on you know, advanced schooling and universities so as context. Uh, but there's nothing in the test really that would be too off putting for, for kind of learners in 15, 16, maybe fifteen as well. I think the, the easiest way to, to determine that is to try that yourself, maybe try that with some of your learners and see what they think. Uh, we do have other tests uh, that are more appropriate for smaller children. Uh, so we have, for example, the English Benchmark Young Learners Tests, which are a fantastic tablet-based, fun, interactive, gamified English test, providing quite similar outcomes in terms of results that are designed for children who are around 6 and 13, 15. Uh, we also have uh, a, a wide portfolio of, of, of tests. I think it's a really interesting question, um, and it's definitely worth uh, picking up go through your needs in a little bit more detail with your, your fifth and second level. Great. The next question is, is it necessary to practice to increase your VEPT score? Are practice tests available for students? Really good question. Um, I would say the answer is no. So practice in terms of taking a test and then taking another test, you shouldn't have to do that. And the way that VEP has been designed, the way the entire verse and suites have been designed, is to be really straightforward and easy to use. So I say we, we deliver over a million verse of tests each year. Uh, I'd say 99.9% .9 of people, but when they come and take the test for the first time, they've never done any practice, they've never done any preparation, they've not even looked at our website. In many cases, they don't even know that they're going to be taking a verse of tests. So it's been designed very much to be something to sit down and take the test. It's not a problem. But as I say, it's useful to have an idea just to put your mind at rest, just to be a little bit less stressed in the test. Maybe just look at the video on YouTube to see what the item types are. There shouldn't really be a great deal of preparation required on that. Uh, users or learners can buy the text directly from uh, the website. Um, but it is not really the most cost effective way of doing it. I think it is, but it's not really necessary. You never say to an institution, go and, and make those people buy tests from the website. It's, it, it just really isn't necessary. If you do feel that learners benefit from having more than one test attempt as an institution, um, you can maybe assign them more than one test. I don't think it's necessary, but if you do, then you can do that. And we can work out in a cost effective way after the learner after have two test attempts. Great, thank you. The next question is, is there any skill that has a priority over others in the test? Really good question. In terms of scoring and weighting, no, there isn't. There's no skill that, that does. Um, in terms of the amount of time that the test, there is more writing time in there because writing takes longer to produce. Uh, so you'll see yeah, there's a, the, uh, the summary of opinion element is 18 minutes long, so it's kind of a miniature essay question. But in terms of weighting of the scores, you know, everything is equally weighted uh, when it goes into the overall score. Thank you. And I think we have time for just one more question, um, and it's a popular one amongst um, our attendees. How much is the Versa and English Placement Test in uh -huh. service for institutions? Very good question, and it is something that you need to take up with your local peers and representative uh, because the, the cost of test does vary a little bit uh, by country. It also varies according to volumes and things like that. What I would say is that this is designed to be a test that universities, if they want to, can apply to every student. So it is designed to be cost effective. It's not, you know, PTEC Academic is a wonderful test and it's value for money. Um, but peak academics typically in the range of two hundred dollars. You will not be paying anything like that for that. Um, but it is something you need to speak to your local representative about, and they can work out a really good price for the institutions. Very often we have a special price for schools and universities, so have that discussion with them. Uh, I'll put in a good word for you for the local rep and make sure you get the best price possible. But again, it's designed to be affordable, and I think that's a key thing. It's affordable for everybody, not just some people. 
All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, lots of great questions, and sorry we didn't have time to get to more of them. Um, so just to wrap up, a recording will be available um, a couple days following the webinar. I posted the link in um, the chat box for everybody to see. Also, certificates will be sent a few hours following um, the webinar. Um, we have lots of other webinars that are coming up in this assessment summer sessions um, series. And I'll post the link right now to um, the agenda where you can sign up for um, you know, future sessions. So with that, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we hope you have a wonderful afternoon or morning or evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.